morning, friends. Good to see all of you. It's good to see friends online. Thank you for tuning, us, tuning in and making us a part of your Sunday morning routine. Sometimes, have you ever missed an invitation? You're supposed to be somewhere or someone called and left a message and you didn't bother to listen to the message and then you realize, oh, I should have been somewhere that I was supposed to be. Or in, you know, something that, uh, a phenomenon I started to experience with the advent of our dependence on Zoom, people send a Zoom invite. And if I don't, li if I don't look at my email for 12 hours or, God forbid, 24 hours, I'll lose it. I'll lose the invite. And then whenever the Zoom meeting is happening, people will say, where are you? <laughs> or I'll get a text, where are you? I didn't get the invite. Yeah, you did. We sent it to you. It's buried. I didn't get it. Zoom meetings. I want to acknowledge the ongoing invitation of Christ for us to come to him, that there's this ongoing invitation to come unto Christ. And that's what spoke to me this morning. That's, was, that was in the, at the, the forefront of my mind. There was a call, there was a still small voice and a call to come unto Christ. And I was reminded of one of my favorite verses here in Matthew chapter 11, verse uh, 28, where Christ articulates this invitation to come unto him. And it reads, come unto me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens. It doesn't say come unto me, all you who are up and at them. You've already had your first cup of coffee and you're ready to go. And if you have a little bit of time, just make some time here. No. There's the acknowledgement of weariness and carrying heavy burdens. And here's the outcome. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. So not only is it rest, but it's an opportunity to be taught. Christ doesn't want us to just come to him so we can treat him like a spa, spa day. No, it's an invitation to come unto him it's an invitation to be taught. The inward teaching of Christ. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. Why? For I am gentle. For I am humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I don't know about you, but this morning, I needed that. <laughs> I needed that invitation. The invitation to come unto one who was gentle, to come unto one that was humble in heart, that I may learn how to live, that I may learn what it is to be human, that I may not forget myself in the pace, the rapid pace of our lives. It's easy to do. I'll find, that, I'll find myself sometimes on a Wednesday or Thursday where I can forget myself. What am I doing? Why am I doing what I'm doing? And do I have a place to go when I realize that? Here's the invitation. We have a place to go. We have one to whom we can go, on, go to. So let's take a moment now. Let's take a moment if today you are carrying a heavy burden. What is that burden? You don't have to, you don't have to talk about it, but you already know it. You've been carrying it. Did you know you have a place to go? Did you know that you have one that says, come unto me? 
Let's take a moment and let that ground us. Let, let, let that center us. And let's hold the silence here together, friends. Loving one, we come unto you and respond to this invitation as best as we know how. To the portion of faith, to the portion of our hearts that have been given to us by your spirit. Even now, we begin to experience your rest. And not only rest, Lord, we begin to experience your divine teaching that makes us more human, more present, more aware, more centered. May your, pre may your peace that transcends our understanding be welcome, not only in this physical space, but in the inner space of the sanctuary of our hearts. We have gathered to attend to you. We thank you for being gentle and humble in heart, O oh shepherd. We pray this, Christ, in your name. Amen and amen. <clears throat> I don't usually do stuff like that in the morning, but that's what happened to me this morning, and I thought, that's a good direction to go. I know I needed it. So I hope that uh, there was something in there that spoke to you. And again, that scripture, maybe for later reference, that scripture is out of Matthew 11, 28 and 29. Friends, we're gonna go ahead and move into our time of music.
Friends of my heart, it's always so good to see you. The reading, there are two. The first from Galatians, chapter 3, verses 27 and 28. As many of you as were baptized in Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ, there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 12 to 14. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all of the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we are all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. Thank you, Darla, <clears throat> for those readings from the New Testament. And uh, if you've been waiting for it, or if you don't know, uh, let me just say, uh, l let me get us started here. Happy World Quaker Day. Today is World Quaker Day. Go figure, it's also me and Megan's 18th, 18th anniversary. <laughs> I made sure we got married on World Quaker Day. <laughs> no, it just happenstance. It's a beautiful day today, especially the sunshine and 
just this time that we could be here together. So as friends and this celebration of World Quaker Day, it's, just, it's an exciting part. It's an exciting part to be a, uh, a part of a, a journey and a spiritual heritage, a tradition and a Christian perspective that has a global witness. World Quake, that's why it's not just called national, it's World Quaker Day, because there's Quakers all over the world and everywhere that, uh, in every continent that we have here. World Quaker Day has begun as a way for friends to recognize and engage in worship in all time zones on the globe. So there's always Quaker worship, holy silence being observed and, and uh, being acknowledged here today. And it's happening in every moment of this day, of World Quaker Day. And that's what World Quaker Day is all about. It's about our connection to one another. You might have picked up on the theme of connection. It's about not only our connection to one another, it's, a, it's also an acknowledgement of our connection to the source of all life. Especially speaking about connection, interconnectedness, this should mean so, uh, something a little bit different now in a post-pandemic world. Remember when we weren't allowed to be connected, not that long ago. We weren't allowed to go out. We weren't allowed to gather. We didn't want to because of that, uh, that time there in 2020. And recognizing and acknowledging and celebrating our connection with others ought to mean something different. It ought to be deeply meaningful to us as we are reminded of that inter interconnectedness and as we were reminded and as we saw what it was to go without it, to be told, no, you cannot be connected in the physical way of being that you would like to be. And yet, to know on this day that there is a group that more or less, maybe we can say, gets it. We get what it is to be connected to one, to one another. We get what it is to be connected to God. What a lovely gift that we have in our Quaker spiritual heritage. FWCC, or Friends World Committee for Consultation, they're the ones that come up with the themes of our annual World Quaker Day. And this year's theme uh, is actually uh, after, named after an indigenous uh, religious wisdom tradition, Ubuntu, Ubuntu. And the, the theme for this year is living the spirit of Ubuntu, responding with hope to God's call to cherish, uh, to cherish creation and to cherish one another. As I was doing a little bit of research here on this, this, ter this term Ubuntu, it's just fun to say, number one, <laughs> Ubuntu. Um, I came across this, uh, this explanation uh, of this on, in uh, Britain Yearly Meetings website. They released this statement about this, this wisdom tradition and what, uh, how we want to celebrate World Quaker Day. To, uh, Day. And it says this here, we're on slide four. Ubuntu refers to the recognition that a person is a person through other persons. I'll reread that. It's a recognition that a person, you and me, are recognized in our, our personhood through other persons. Or more succinctly, I am because we are. Not I, I think, therefore I am. Go, kind of pushes against that philosophical tradition here in the West, but I am because we are. An ancient wisdom emphasizing community and interdependence, Ubuntu. It has been revived and reasserted through struggles against colonialism and against apartheid there in South Africa. The popularity of Ubuntu in its Christian articulation is often associated with Desmond Tutu, 
a friend of Quakers who was nominated, who nominated him for a Nobel Peace Prize. Ubuntu resonates with the Quaker belief of that of God in everyone. That of God in everyone. To be a part of a, of a religious tradition that recognizes that first and foremost the humanity of everyone, that humanitizes the other and says there is a humanness in each person. There is that of God in everyone. In South, Southern Africa's Book of Faith and Practice, uh, Ubuntu is described as being rooted in the invisible circuit of connection between us all. Being rooted in the, <clears throat> being rooted in the invisible circuit of connection between us all. It is often also reflected biblically, for example, as we heard here today, in Paul's words in Corinthians, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And also in Galatians chapter 3, you all are one. So we have this Christian articulation and lens that we can see, this idea of Ubuntu. In practice, it means everyone has a responsibility for the welfare of the whole community and ensuring that people have what they need. This extends to care for the environment since people are part of the same God-given creation that is an interdependent whole. That's our statement from Britain Yearly Meeting. As I was, you know, kind of thinking about uh, this, this indigenous wisdom tradition and doing some research, sometimes there is the recognition that, you know, sometimes other people say it better. <laughs> and we've done this, this before where we see a, a short film or a short movie that, uh, that we learn about something new. And I found that. It was put together by the BBC and it, it, and it covers this idea of Ubuntu. And I would like us to, this is kind of a movie day, okay? So we're going to turn the lights down a little bit and we're gonna watch this short film on the meaning and the embodiment in this, philosoph this uh, uh, philosophy or I guess wisdom tradition we'll call it of Ubuntu. After that I, would, I have some queries that I would like us to consider as we go into a time of open worship. But um, Bert, whenever you're ready, and then we'll get the lights as well. Be wise to what's happening around you. Can you read what's happening around you? in society, in your families, <clears throat> in institutions, in our culture? Are we reading it? When I consider Ubuntu as an indigenous wisdom, and then as I use my glasses for an example, put on the perspective of what scripture and Christ is asking me to do, I can't help but think, wow, now is a right t ripe time for, some, for something such as this to happen. It's always been there. It's always been ripe, but even for such a time as this, in our time, in our place, in our culture, there is a need and a searching for a universal harmonizer, so to speak. This makes sense. And it makes sense because it melds so well with a Christ-centered way of seeing the world. Ubuntu. I would like us to center down and consider some of the following queries as we go into a time of open worship. <clears throat> uh, 
Thank you. I'll just read through them. How would you express the concept of Ubuntu in the language or culture you are most familiar with? How does this fit here? What would the effects be if our global Quaker community were to follow the precepts of Ubuntu more closely? How can we go about this? If Ubuntu is not about just the idea, we love ideas and just keeping it an idea, it's in here, and it never translates into our hands and feet. As the professor was saying in the video, it must translate into our hands and feet. Or as Mother Teresa said, compassion is worthless if it never translates into our actions. It doesn't mean we need to showboat about it. It doesn't mean we need to tell everyone about what we've done. But it must translate into our action. Thirdly, how can churches, meeting houses, and communities work for changes in the governments, economic and political structures to embrace the principle of Ubuntu? Well, I thought this was a curious one. From where does hope come? From where does hope come? Friends, We've already begun this meeting with an invitation to come unto the one who is gentle and humble, that we may be taught. Let's take some time to attend to that inward teacher, that we may be taught. And if you feel so moved to share in vocal ministry, Suzanne has a microphone. If you feel moved of spirit to share. Friends online, make sure you're unmuted if you feel so moved to share. Let's take some time and sink into this wisdom of Ubuntu in terms of how it reflects that inward teaching of Christ.